Now, this morning, we're just going to finish what we started last week. So last week, we looked at the first half of Revelation chapter 5. So this morning, we're just going to keep going, and we're going to finish Revelation chapter 5 as John has been describing for us his vision of heaven. And so now with that, Revelation chapter 5, we're going to pick it up in verse 8, as the Apostle John now says, Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and, and, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and, and thousands of thousands saying in a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen, and the 24 elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. Now, uh, it's been said that that, that in heaven there will be three wonders. There will be three wonders in heaven. And number one, the first wonder is who's there. Because, you know, when you get to heaven, you you might see some people in heaven that you didn't think would be there. So that's the first wonder. The second wonder, however, in heaven is who's not there. Because you, you, might, you might think that there's some people who, who will get to heaven who would definitely be in heaven, but they're not there. So the first wonder, who's there? The second wonder, who's not there? But then the third wonder is that you're there. <laughs> Well, that's what we want to talk about this morning here in Revelation chapter 5, the three wonders of heaven, the three wonders of heaven. Because remember, ever since chapter 4, we've seen that the apostle John has been caught up in heaven. And now he's describing for us what he sees in heaven. And so he's been caught up, and he says he sees this throne, and he sees the one who sits on the throne. And then he says that that it's the Lord himself. And then he says that the, the Lord himself is portrayed in three different ways, as we saw last week in the first half of chapter 5, where we see that the Lord himself is portrayed as, as the lion and the lamb and the landowner who then takes the scroll, which, as we mentioned last time, was the title deed of planet Earth itself. And then he breaks open those seals. He breaks open the scroll in order to buy back that which was rightfully his. And so now this morning, as he does this, now all of a sudden we see that, that all of heaven is now breaking out in, a, in, a, in an anthem of praise, in a chorus of praise. Charles Spurgeon used to say that when you speak on heaven, there should be a a glow on your face and a gleam in your eyes and a smile on your lips. But when you talk about hell, your normal face will work just fine. (laughs) Well, this morning, uh, we want to talk about the three wonders of heaven. And so now as we look again at verse 8, we're going to discover the first wonder of heaven. The first wonder of heaven, verse 8, the Apostle John says again, Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So again, John's describing what he sees. And so he says, I see a throne and, and I see a rainbow around the throne. The glory of the Lord is just radiating from that throne. And then he says, I see 24 elders around the throne. And, and remember, as we mentioned back in chapter 4, we believe that the 24 elders represent the raptured church that's now in heaven. That the, the, the church is no longer on the earth at this point in Revelation. They've been raptured. They've been caught up, removed from the earth, and they're now in in heaven. If you weren't here for Revelation chapter 4, you might want to grab a copy of the CD and listen to that teaching. And so the 24 elders are gathered around the throne. And then he says he sees 
four living creatures around the throne, which I believe are the same thing that Isaiah calls uh, the, the seraphim in Isaiah chapter 6, because they are described exactly the same way, exactly the same way. And so he sees the 24 elders, he sees the four living creatures, and then he sees, he sees hundreds and, and millions and millions of angels all around the throne. Now, as wondrous as all those things are, listen, none of those things are the main attraction. As Skip Heidzig, the pastor of Calvary, Albuquerque, puts it, he says, what makes heaven heaven is not that the angels are there or that the streets of gold are there. No, what makes heaven heaven is that the God you know and love is there and you get to see him face to face. That's what makes heaven heaven. And so as glorious as all of this scene is that John, John is describing to us, listen, all of that pales in comparison to the lamb which was slain that now enters the scene. Because now as the lamb enters into the scene, now all of a sudden, all of heaven, the angels of heaven, the, the seraphim, the, the cherubim, the 24 elders, all of heaven, it says in verse 9, fell down before the lamb. They fell down before the Lamb. Let me ask you this. Have you ever been in the presence of greatness? I mean, have you ever met, you know, a professional athlete or, or, or maybe a, a, you're, you're, you know, you're a famous actor or maybe your favorite musician? And, you know, you meet them and, and when you meet them, you're in their presence. You ever feel the pressure to, to, like, be really cool or to be really funny or to say something really profound only to make a complete bumbling idiot out of yourself? Yeah, me neither. Uh, you see, here's the picture in Revelation chapter 5. The picture is that the, the, as the Lamb, as the Lord himself enters into heaven, all of a sudden, all of heaven is awestruck as the Lamb enters the scene. You know, it's like, it, it's like a bunch of preteen girls at a Bieber concert. That's what it's like. I mean, they're falling down everywhere, just falling down. And so as soon as the Lamb comes into the room, all of a sudden, all of heaven realizes they are in the presence of greatness, absolute greatness, as it says they fell down. Now, by the way, that word fell down in the original is one Greek word. It's the Greek peepto. This is a word that means to fall down as though you had been violently slain. Fall down as if you've been violently slain. And, and by the way, it's the exact same term that John used in the first chapter of Revelation. When he first gets this vision and he sees all of this happening and then all of a sudden in chapter one, he says he sees the Lord himself. And here's what he says. He says in Revelation 1.17, he says, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me saying to me, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. And, and so John said, when I saw the Lord, I, I thought I was going to die. I, I fell down as though I had been slain. It's that same word. And quite frankly, by the way, this is the, the same reaction that Moses himself had in the Old Testament. Remember when Moses was on, on the top of Mount Sinai and we're told that he spent 40 days and 40 nights on the top of that mountain in the presence of God, receiving what we call the Ten Commandments. Now he was in the presence of the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. You know, some of us, we, we would call that a, a mountaintop experience, right? just basking in the presence of, of the Lord, 40 days, 40 nights. You might say that, that's 40 days of purpose right there. It's a Rick Warren joke. Uh, well, listen, the Bible wouldn't call it 40 days of purpose. The Bible would call it 40 days of fire. 40 days of fire. Listen, the Bible says in Exodus 23, 17, that the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of that mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. 40 days in the presence of the Lord. And it was like being in a mountain that was on fire. You see, I don't think Moses was up on top of that mountain just basking and saying, kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya. No, I, I, th I think he was terrified. In fact, the New Testament tells us exactly how Moses was feeling. Did you know that in Hebrews 12, 21, it says, and so terrible was that sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. 
40 days and 40 nights. And this is what Moses felt in the presence of the Lord. It's the same thing that John's describing in in Revelation chapter 1. When I saw the Lord, I fell down as though I had been slain, as though I was dead. And now, in Revelation chapter 5, all of the host of heaven, all of the host of heaven falls down as though they had been slain, and they fall down at the feet of the Lamb in the presence of greatness. Now, along with that, it then says that each one has a harp. Now, this, of course, is where we get all those lame pictures of, you know, us going to heaven, you know, sitting on a cloud, I don't know, wearing a diaper, you know, <laughs> plucking a little harp, you know, blue, 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 bling, right? It might help you to know that the word harp that's used here is better translated lyre. Now, the instrument that's really described here in the original is, is an instrument that was made out of, a, out of a hollow rectangular box with a hole in the center of it and a long neck. And down that long neck were 10 strings that covered the hole in the center of the hollow box. Now, what does that sound like to you? Does that sound like a harp? No, that sounds like a guitar, right? Or maybe at least an Eastern guitar like the zither. But I mean, you know, and it says that each one has uh, one of these. You ever want to learn the guitar? Well, you will in heaven. I mean, this is like a heavenly praise band. That's what this is. I mean, everybody's got like their own guitar. Some have flames on them. I don't know. <laughs> but they all got their own guitar and, and, or their own, their own stringed instrument. And, 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 they're, and they're praising the Lord. Then along with that, it says that they also had bowls, golden bowls of incense that were representing the prayers of the saints. Now, what's that all about? Well, here's what that's all about. You see, in the Old Testament, keep in mind that the priests would often go into the temple and pray on behalf of the people by by going into the temple and then lighting the incense that was in those golden bowls on the altar. And as they did, as they lit that incense, then they would pray on behalf of the people of Israel. And so those prayers were representing the prayers of the people. And this just reminds us, doesn't it, that when we pray for others, listen to this, Our prayers for others are a sweet-smelling aroma before God. As far as he's concerned, you're offering incense. Uh, The late Bible teacher Ray Stedman uh, put an interesting twist on it when he said, there's a profound and exhilarating truth for you and me in this image. We, the redeemed, actually get to contribute to the work of redemption with our prayers with our prayers. You see, listen, here's the picture. The picture is that there's a day coming when Jesus Christ will come back to this planet, to planet earth. He'll come back to redeem that which is rightfully his, to buy back that which is rightfully his. There's coming a day when Jesus Christ will come back. But listen to this, until then, until that day, he's given us the opportunity to participate in his plan of redemption. And we participate in that plan not only by sharing our testimonies with people, not only by sharing the gospel with the lost, but we participate in that plan when we pray for the lost, when we pray for others, when we pray for the lost. Listen to this. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 2, verse 1 says, pray on behalf of all men. Why? Well, verse 4 answers that question, saying, because God desires all men to be saved. Pray on behalf of all men because God desires all men to be saved. And when you pray for others, when you pray for the lost, you get to participate in that work of redemption. You're offering incense on behalf of others. And so again, in the Old Testament, the the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and he would light those golden bowls of incense. And as he did, he would pray for the people. But while he was inside the temple praying on behalf of the people, meanwhile, the people themselves were in the outer court of the temple and they were praying too. And their prayers went up as incense before the Lord. Even as it says in Psalm 141 too, it says, let my prayer be like incense placed before you. Hey, you must never forget that your prayers are a sweet smelling aroma before God. I mean, when you're praying, you're filling heaven with that aroma. So the first wonder of heaven, 
that the Lord himself will be there. He will be there. His glory will permeate that place. And now as we pick it up in verses 9 and 10, now we come to the second wonder of heaven, as, as John continues and he says, and they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made, made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. So it says they sang a new song. Now, according to the experts, uh, there, there are at least 14 different songs of praise in the book of Revelation. And five of those songs are recorded right here between chapter 4 and chapter 5. And it says they sang a new song to the Lord. Now, that word new that's used there means it means new in quality. It, it, means, it means fresh, reminding us that, that God's not into recycling, reminding us that, that God's not into repackaging the same old stuff. You know, he doesn't take the old stuff and put a new label on it. No, he's into new. In fact, let me see if you can finish this slogan for me. This is a little thing we like to do around here that we call group participation. So I'll do my part, and then you're going to do your part. Okay, are you ready? So let's see if you can, if you can finish this slogan. Ready? Out with the old and... That's right. You see, that's what God does. He doesn't just like put a new twist on the old. It's out with the old and in with the new. In with the new. He's into the new. Jesus said in Revelation 21, 5, he said, Behold, I'm making all things new. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Out with the old, in with the new. And over and over again, the, the scripture talks about new. New wineskins, new heaven and new earth, a, a new work. And now here in Revelation, a new song. Now, who's singing this, this, this new song? Who sings this new song? Well, it, 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 it's the elders. It's the 24 elders. As we said, the 24 elders represent the, the church that's now in heaven. Specifically, in context, it's those who have been redeemed. Because in the middle of verse 9, it says, And you have redeemed us to God by your blood. The redeemed are the ones who are singing the song. Now, by the way, that word redeem that's used there, in the original is the Greek agorazo. This is a word that, 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 that speaks of the agora, or, uh, which was that, that ancient marketplace in those days where slaves would have been bought and sold. And so you see, in those days, by the way, when, when, when they talk about slaves, in those days, the way you became a slave was because you had so much debt. I mean, you were just in, over your head, in debt. Have I described anybody in the room? Anybody know what it's like to be in over your head, a slave to your creditors? Well, see, in those days, I mean, if you were a slave to debt, I mean, if you were in over your head in debt, you know, they didn't have like debt consolidation programs, okay? So in those days, what you would do is you would go to the Agora, you'd go to the marketplace, and you would sell yourself as a slave in order to pay off the debt that you owed to someone else. But it says here that, that he, Jesus, the lamb that was slain, has redeemed us to God by his blood. He's redeemed us. See, here's the idea. The idea is that he didn't purchase us as slaves. No, he redeemed us. He purchased us in order to set us free, in order to set us free. There's a story from a, at least 150 years ago or so of a distinguished gentleman wearing a, a top hat, and, and, he, and he went to one of those slave markets, and he bought a, a slave girl there, a young black girl, barely 20 years old, and, and he bought her. And then when the whole thing was over, he then walks away, and she then follows after him, and he's like, well, where are you going? She's going, well, I'm going with you. You just bought me. He said, no, you don't get it. I didn't buy you to make you my slave. I bought you to set you free. He then took the copy of the bill of sale, wrote in big, bold letters the word free right across the front of it, signed his name to it, and gave it to her. She then looked at it, and she said, you mean I'm free? He said, yeah, absolutely. He said, you mean I, 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 can, I can go wherever I want to go and do whatever I please to do? He said, absolutely. 
She said, well, then if I'm free and if I can go wherever I want to go and do whatever I want to do, well, then nothing would please me more than to go with you and serve you for the rest of my days. And from that moment forward, she went home with Abraham Lincoln, not as his slave, but as his willing servant and endeared friend. And listen, that is the picture that the Bible paints of us. As, as believers in Christ, as servants of Christ. Listen, we're servants not out of slavery. We're servants out of love. He redeemed us by his own blood to set us free. So there's a new song in heaven. And who's singing this new song? Answer, the redeemed. Answer, you and me. We're in heaven. The church is not on the earth at this point. We are in heaven, and we're singing a new song. Now, I mean, think about that for just a moment. I mean, how stinking cool is that? I mean, listen, I can't even get tickets to the Broncos game, and yet I'm going to be in heaven. I mean, you and I, we're going to be there, and we're going to be front and center, a front row seat, and we're going to see that throne that John's describing. We're going to be there. So the first wonder of heaven, he's there. The second wonder of heaven, you're there. You get to be there if you've been redeemed, if you've accepted Christ. Now that brings us to the third wonder of heaven as we continue in verses 11 through 13. And John now says, And then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000. And thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. I'm yelling because there's an explanation part mark in my Bible. Verse 13, And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and as such are in the sea and all that is in them I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. That's a good place for an amen. That's that's an okay thing to do. And so John says he sees sees all of these beings. He he said he sees the, uh, uh, the, 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 the angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders. Now, by the way, it didn't say 24 elders this time. It just said elders. How many? He said 10,000 times 10,000. And that's another reason I believe that the word elders here is not representing just 24, but the entire church that's been raptured off of the earth, and they're now in heaven before the throne. And so he says, I see 10,000 times 10,000 and and thousands upon thousands. One translation says myriads and myriads. Because in the original, it's just saying it it was innumerable, too many to count. You see, in in the original, in in the Greek, the highest number they had was 10,000 at that time. And so if you wanted to say that something was was too big to be counted, you would say it was 10,000 times 10,000. It'd be like saying, you know, it was a bazillion times a bazillion. Listen, I was public schooled, and even I know that's a lot. Just saying. So there's like this this anthem of praise that's breaking up, this this chorus of praise. And so John says, you know what? That the elders, they were there, and they're shouting out, and they're singing, worthy is the lamb who was slain. And then all of a sudden, the the angels join in, and the seraphim join in, the living creatures join in. And then all of a sudden, this anthem of praise reaches its crescendo in verse 13 when all of creation joins in. And it says in verse 13 that every creature in heaven and on the earth, and under the earth, and in the sea, every creature joins in on this anthem of praise. And they're praising the Lord, and they're saying blessing, and honor, and glory, and power. Just as it says in Psalm 150, verse 6, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And so the scene here in heaven now is just like the scene in every Disney movie we've ever seen growing up, right? Because now even the animals are talking and singing, right? Just like every Disney movie. Hakuna Matata. Yeah, Hakuna Matata. It's a wonderful phrase. Hakuna Matata. It's a wonderful phrase. Hakuna Matata. It's our philosophy. 
for guilt-free living. You know, it's, it's like these animals now are just breaking out, and, and it's like real life. It's not like Walt Disney animatronics. It's the real thing. All of heaven is joining in. Now, of course, this, this brings up the question, do animals go to heaven? Well, we don't know. The Bible doesn't say if they go to heaven, but here in Revelation, we see that animals are in heaven. Because in, in Revelation, we see lions mentioned. We see creatures that, that are described like leopards. We see horses. We see every creature here joining in in this chorus. And all of the, the point of the matter is simply this. All of creation now joins in in this anthem of praise. It's not just the church. It's not just the angels. All of creation, heaven and earth and under the earth and in the sea, they're all joining in. So that now brings us in verse 14 to the activity of heaven. You know, what are we going to do when we get there? Well, no, we don't have a complete picture, but verse 14 at least gives us a sample, gives us an idea, as Revelation 5 verse 14 says, the four living creatures said amen, and the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. And so the 24 elders represent the church. And what do they do? They fell down and worshiped him forever and ever. So that's among the activities that we're going to be doing when we're in heaven. We're going to be worshiping the Lord. And so what are the three wonders of heaven? Number one, as we said, is the Lord himself. He's going to be there, and we're going to see him in all his glory. Uh, Number two, the second wonder is the fact that you and I, by the grace of God, actually get to be there and actually see all this for ourselves. And then wonder number three is the simple fact that all of creation will be there, not just the angels. The angels are there, the seraphim are there, the cherubim are there, uh, the, the elders are there. But all of creation is there. So here's the picture that John's describing between Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5. John says, you know what? I was caught up into heaven. And when I was there, I saw this throne. And I saw the one who was sitting on the throne. And, 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 and his glory, his radiance was like the radiance of diamonds and rubies. And there was like this glowing radiance. And, and it was the Lord himself. And there was lightning coming from the throne. And there was a pillar of fire at the throne. And there was this roaring fire thunder coming from the throne. And there were these 24 men, these these 24 elders all gathered around the throne. And they were bowing before the throne saying, worthy is the lamb that was slain. And then on top of that, there were these living beings with with like, you know, eyes all over their bodies and six wings. and, and, And they're crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty. And then there were hundreds and millions and bazillions of angels all gathered around the throne and worshiping at the throne. And if you remember in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus said, he promised, if you overcome, if you overcome this world, he said, you will be there in heaven. Listen, if that doesn't get you fired up, nothing will. You get to be there in heaven. But again, it brings up the question, what are we going to do when we get there? What's the activity of heaven? Well, again, we don't know everything, but this passage would seem to imply that among the activities in heaven is going to be a whole lot of singing, lots and lots of singing. And I know when I mention that, some of you, I mean, that excites you. I mean, some of you here is going to be lots of singing. You're like, oh, that is awesome. Others of you, you know, you hear they're, they're singing, and quite frankly, that terrifies you. Because quite frankly, you hear there's going to be lots and lots of singing, and and, and you just heard that you're going to be forced to try out for the next American Idol. (laughs) Shebang. (laughs) It just terrifies you. (laughs) Hey, listen. I mean, for some of you, your life verse is probably Psalm 98 verse 4, right? It says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Didn't say anything about singing. And by the way, aren't you glad it didn't say sing in perfect pitch unto the Lord? It just said make a joyful noise. But can I just say that not all noise is joyful? Some of it's just noise. You know, like, like the little girl who spent the night at her grandma's and, and they went to church together and the soloist got up and she sang. And, and while she was singing, the little girl turns to her grandma and says, Grandma, she can't sing very good, can she? She said, Oh, honey, she sings from her heart. That's what makes it good. 
So they're driving a little bit later, and a ra- they're listening to the radio. A song comes on, and Grandma starts singing along, and, and the little girl looks up and says, Grandma, you sing from your heart too, don't you? <laughs> hey, a lot of us sing from the heart, don't we? Do you know what? There's going to be a lot of singing in heaven. We know this because back in verse 9 it says, they sang a new song. And and every time you see they sang a new song, it always mentions the elders, the 24 elders. They sang a new song. Now, by the way, in the original, uh, the the word that's used here for sing or sang, you know, Silo, he he often says there's a difference between singing and then there's sangin'. When you get to heaven, you're going to be sangin'. There's going to be feeling behind what you're doing, right? I mean, you're going to sing like it means something to you. In fact, the word that's used here means to chant with emotion. It means to chant or to sing with feeling and with heart. Do you know what this looks like? What it looks like is, is that you're like at a Broncos Raiders game and, 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 and the defense is like doing this major goal line stand and you're there, you're sitting in the front row and it's right in front of you and you are chanting with everything you've got. I mean, you are going nuts, you are screaming and cheering and, and, and you're not holding back, you're giving it all you've got. That's this word, chant and sing with emotion, with feeling. And by the way, <laughs> in the original, this is, this is in a particular Greek tense that just means that it's ongoing, that it's never ending. And so when it says, sing with emotion, chant with feeling, it's saying that that should be never ending and ongoing. In other words, you should be singing with feeling even when you don't feel like singing. Well, let me ask you this. Have you ever gone to a church service, a worship service, and just sort of lip sync your way through it? Just sort of go through the motions and then afterwards say, well, I just didn't feel like it? Well, a verse like this is reminding us that we sing with feeling whether we feel like it or not. It reminds me of the old story of the ancient medieval, medieval monasteries and how they adopted the custom of the, of the ancient temple in Israel that, that there should always be praise offered to God no matter what, that praise to God should never cease. And so they always had someone, they always had a monk who was singing praises to God. So if one monk start, stopped, another monk would pick up where he left off and they would keep the praise going. It was never ending. Well, on one occasion, the monastery was overrun by a group of, of Norse raiders who came in and, and one by one killed each and every one of these monks. And so as they slaughtered one, another one would start singing. And they slaughtered him, and another one would start singing one by one until they slaughtered each and every monk. That is, all but one. One monk made it, and he survived, and he escaped to the mountains and hid in a cave. And when he discovered that, that no one else, none of his other brothers were singing, he just couldn't help himself. He burst out in song, singing with feeling, whether you feel like it or not. Now listen, can I just say, I think we, we've got it all messed up. I mean, when it comes to, to worship, I mean, when it comes to, you know, when it comes to what we're going to be doing in heaven and, and what heaven is and, and, and the activity of heaven and, and worshiping and singing, I, I think, quite frankly, we, we get it all messed up. Listen, you talk about the three wonders of heaven, heaven is going to be filled with nothing but wonder. I mean, it's going to be the most amazing thing you've ever seen. It's going to be filled with wonder. So think about this. I mean, why is it we don't mind camping out all night long in front of like a ticket master to get tickets to our favorite show, to our favorite band, and yet it's so hard for us to get up early to make it to a worship service. I I think we got it all messed up. I don't think we really got an idea, a clue of what it is we're really doing. We are participating in heavenly activity. This is a little heaven on earth because we're going to be doing this and it's going to be bursting out and it's it's going to be so awesome. All of creation joins in. I mean, I I don't think we get it. You want to hear something that will really blow your mind? Listen to this. Not only will you be singing to him in heaven, but did you know, check this out, that he will be singing to you as well? That's what the Bible says in Zephaniah 3.17. Zephaniah 3.17, he will rejoice over you with 
singing. He will rejoice over you with singing. I mean, you know what? I mean, you know how it is when, whenever you think about God and whenever you think about all that God's done in your life and, and all, all that God's done and how much he loves you and how much he's transformed you. I mean, you know how when you're thinking about him, you just can't help yourself. You just burst out into song. Well, this verse in Zephaniah is reminding us that sometimes when he thinks about you, he bursts out in song. A.W. Tozer once described worship this way. He said, you are serenading Jesus. It's heavenly activity. I don't think we get it, but I think we should try, don't you? So on that note, why don't we stand and and let's participate in a little heaven on earth and let's just pour ourselves out before the Lord and let's sing with feeling whether we feel like it or not. Who's with me? So Father, we thank you for your grace and we thank you for your kindness. We thank you, Lord, that you have redeemed us by your blood. You bought us, you purchased us to set us free. And so it's in the freedom that you've given us that we've come to serve you in worship. It's in the freedom that you've given us that we stand and we pour our hearts out and we give it all that we've got because we love you. And so now we're going to praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.